We just concluded the election season in the United States of America. And I'm not sure if your political party won the election or lost the election, but I can tell you no matter what side of the fence you fall on, we as Americans have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be thankful for. In fact, thankfulness is a part of our national heritage. If you go all the way back to the very beginning of our country, you'll see that thankfulness is a part of who we as Americans are. In 1789, President George Washington issued the first presidential Thanksgiving proclamation. And he designated Thursday, November 26th as a day that we as Americans will, and I quote, acknowledge with grateful hearts and many signal favors of Almighty God. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. And in fact, it wasn't until the year 1863 that President Abraham Lincoln made Thanksgiving an annual tradition in our country. And since that day, every single November, we set a day aside on our calendar where we look inward, where we look outward, and where we look upward just to say, thank you, thank you, God. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. You say, why should I be thankful today? Can I give you one reason why you should be thankful? Because God tells you to be thankful. You go to the book of Psalms. He says in Psalm 147, 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. He said that you ought to be singing a song today that says, thank you, Jesus. You say, well, what if I don't like the song? It has nothing to do with your preference. It has everything to do with what God has told you to do. And he said, you should be singing a song of thanksgiving because you, my friend, are blessed. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 14, he said, sacrifice a thank offering to God and pay your vows to the most High. He said, you ought to be a giver, and your giving ought to be an expression of your gratitude for what God has done in your life. You go to Psalm chapter 95, verse 2, he said, let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. He said, every time you come into my presence, you ought to be thankful, because I am a good, good God, and I have blessed you beyond your imagination. See, the fact of the matter is God has called you and I to thanksgiving. He's called us to be thankful, not just as Americans. He, he's called us to thanksgiving as Christians. Our thanksgiving didn't originate on the shores of Plymouth. Our thanksgiving was initiated on a hill called Golgotha. That's why we're thankful today. God tells us, listen, if you know Jesus Christ, if you've been saved by the blood of the lamb, I've given you every reason that you need to be thankful today. So praise God from whom all blessings flow. He said, give thanks to the Lord. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 118, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And isn't it good to know that the way that God loves you is with a love that lasts forever? Isn't it good to know that his love doesn't waver in your life? He doesn't love you more today or love you more tomorrow, that his love endures forever and ever and ever. Listen, that ought to give us thankful hearts today. As I was reading that passage this week, I was reminded of a story in the book of Hosea. And if you have your Bible today, I'm gonna invite you to open it up to the book of Hosea, okay? It's gonna take you a minute. Hosea, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. It's right there in that chunk of the Old Testament. And so as you're turning there to the book of Hosea, to the third chapter, I want to tell you a little bit about this guy named Hosea. Hosea was a prophet. His prophetic ministry began around the year 755 BC. His reign as a prophet, he was, he was a spiritual advisor to six different kings that had a brief reign in that part of the world. And he was a successor of Amos's ministry. He was also a, a contemporary of some guys like Isaiah, guys like Micah. So this man named Hosea is a prophet of the Lord. But in addition to being a prophet of the Lord, Hosea was also a husband. He was a married man. He was married to a woman named Gomer. Now, Gomer was a Marine with a high-pitched voice that worked on cars in a place called Mayberry. Just kidding. Just, not really. Gomer wasn't a Marine. But Gomer was the wife of this prophet of God named Hosea. In fact, the word Gomer in the Hebrew, it literally means completion. 
So that's the way God designed all marriage, and in particular, their marriage. Gomer was supposed to complete Hosea as they were united as one flesh, as husband and wife. But when you look at the word of God, you see that Gomer didn't really live up to her name. In fact, the Bible tells us that Gomer, even though she was married to Hosea, she was unfaithful to her husband. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that Gomer prostituted herself out to other men while being married to this prophet of God. The NIV calls her a promiscuous woman. The NASB calls her a harlot. The King James in defining Gomer uses a word that I don't even feel comfortable speaking into this microphone today. So needless to say, Gomer was unfaithful to her husband. And now in this passage of scripture, God's having a conversation with this prophet of God and he's telling him how he should respond to his unfaithful wife. How he should respond to this this woman and how he should love her despite the fact that she was seemingly unlovable. And so that's the conversation that we see beginning in verse one. It says, then the Lord said to me, Go again, show love to a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, just as the Lord loves the Israelites. See, through this story, God's going to give us a beautiful picture of restoration and reconciliation between a husband and a wife. But he's also going to give us an incredible symbolic story where the people involved in the story really do have representation in a way that we can identify with today. So when you read this story about Gomer, this sinful, adulterous woman, I want you to understand that she gives us a picture of a sinner. She gives us a picture of us. She's me. She's you in the story. And when we read about Hosea and how he extended his love to his adulterous wife, he's going to give us a beautiful picture of the faithfulness of Almighty God. God told Hosea, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Do you remember how unlovable the Israelites were in this passage? Do you remember how unfaithful God's children had been time and time again? God was telling Hosea, Hosea, I know how you feel. I know what it's like to love somebody who cheats on you over and over again. I know what it's like to love somebody who's been unfaithful time and time again. I get it. You say, Jordan, what does this have to do with Thanksgiving? What does this have to be? What does this have to do with being thankful today? Listen to me. When you just stop and consider how God loves you right now, it will give you all the reasons in the world why you should be thankful. That's all you have to hear today. That's all you have to know today to understand how our gratefulness and our thankfulness ought to exceed everything else in our life. Because God is so good and he is so faithful. You say, how does God love me? Listen, he loves you the same way he was telling Hosea to love his unfaithful wife. This morning, if you're taking notes, I want to give you three examples of this love that I'm talking about. You say, how does God love me? Listen, he loves you with an unconditional love. That's a word that we don't really get very well. Because what that means is that right now, God loves you. And guess what? There's nothing you can do today to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do today to make God love you any less. Like his love is that consistent. It's that constant. It doesn't matter if you go to church, if you don't go to church. Guess what? He loves you. He loves you. You are his child and his love is consistent. His love is unconditional. In other words, even though she's embarrassed you, even though she's cheated on you, you've got to love her, Hosea. I'm sure he's thinking, what? What are you talking about? But God says, that's the way I love and that's what I'm asking you to do here as well. And then God is going to draw this parallel back to the children of Israel. And he says, listen, they've been cheating on me a long time. They've been unfaithful to me a long time. They've worshipped false gods. They're making sacrifices to these false deities. They've embarrassed me as their God. They've profaned my name as children of God. Listen, I understand where you're at. It's an unconditional love. Look at verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go again, show love to a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress 
Just as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. They turn to other gods and they love raisin cakes. (laughs) What? (laughs) We'll get there. Hold on. But I want you to see, God is saying, she's cheated on you. I get it. My people have cheated on me. She's loved other men other than you. I get it. Listen, my own children have loved false gods more than they've loved me. They've loved temples made of concrete and stone more than they've loved me, the God who created them and keeps their heart beating. They've loved all of these. They're making sacrifices. They're worshiping false gods that will never get them anywhere in life instead of loving me. They love all of these. They love raisin cakes more than they love me. What's a raisin cake? (laughs) You know what it is? It's a cake made of raisins, for real. A cake made of raisins? Really? A cake made of raisins. In fact, if you look historically at this date and this time and this era, it was a very common thing. The Hebrews, what they would do is they would take raisins and they would crush the raisins and they would put them in a mold and they would crush them until it was just a big raisin paste. And once those crushed raisins were in a mold, what they would do is they'd let it air dry and they would harden. And then once they would harden, they would pull it out and it would be a hardened sugary treat. And and this day and time, sugary treats were very rare. And so raisin cakes became a delicacy that was very common for the Hebrew people. In fact, it was something that was rare and loved so much that they would offer these sugary treats to idols as an expression of their thankfulness to idols, an expression of their worship, an expression of their sacrifice. They're bringing raisin cakes to idols as an expression of their worship. And God is having this conversation with Hosea, and he's like, dude, I get it. I get it. Gomer's been unfaithful. She's been chasing things other than you. I get it. I get it because my own children, the ones I've created, the ones that should love me more than anything, are chasing little Debbies. They're chasing dessert. They're chasing things that taste sweet for a moment, and they arouse our senses in a moment, but then in the end, they offer absolutely no nutritional value. They bring absolutely no benefit to your life whatsoever, and yet they continue to chase raisin cakes. I don't get it. So he's looking at Jose, and he's saying, I understand what you're going through. I understand that you feel ripped off. You feel cheated. You feel belittled, but even in this moment, you've got to love her. You've got to love her. See, that's the way that God loves you. Don't miss this. When you were in your sin, when you were chasing everything else in the world except for God, God loved you. His love has been consistent from the very first day. He loves us that way. You go to Romans chapter five, verse eight, it says, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that he just loved you. No, he gave his life for you. And aren't you thankful that he didn't wait until you cleaned up your life before you were acceptable to him? Aren't you glad that that he didn't wait until your sickness was all gone and you were finally healed before he said, now you're an acceptable child of God? He said, no, even when you're disgusting, even when you're sick, even when you're far from me, listen, I love you so much, I'm willing to give my life for you. That's how much he loves us. His love is unconditional. But guess what? Not only that, his love is redemptive. He loved us with a redemptive love. Read verse two. So I bought her. Do you see those words? So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley. I bought her. And I said to her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be promiscuous or belong to any man, and I will act the same way towards you. I love this part of the story. Because this wife who had been unfaithful, this wife who had been far away from the place that she should have been, in that moment, Hosea made redemption possible for her. I mean, just look at the scripture. 
when his wife found herself in slavery, Hosea paid the price that had to be paid to move her from being in slavery to being in freedom. Do you get that? See, in the same way, God gives us the picture here of his children and they're running away from God and they're chasing everything that they shouldn't be chasing. And in that moment when they're pursuing raisin cakes, God says, I'm giving you the opportunity to be redeemed. I'm giving you the opportunity to be restored. I'm giving you a chance to move from being in bondage and slavery to living in freedom once and for all. You didn't deserve that freedom. Listen, you deserve hell but you don't get what you deserve, not through the grace of Jesus. He said, I'm gonna make salvation possible for you. I'm gonna break your chains once and for all. You see, we are sinners and we understand what this is about because you and I know what it's like to chase raisin cakes. You say, I've never chased dessert. Yes, you have. You're going to on Thursday, right? But listen, it's not about chasing dessert. It's about what those raisin cakes represent in your life. You see, for some of us, we would have to admit, chasing raisin cakes is really just chasing success. It's chasing applause. It's chasing approval. It's chasing my sin. It's chasing my lust. My raisin cake is pornography or it's adultery or it's drugs or it's alcohol. It's something that I have elevated above God and I have chased more than I've chased God. I have chased raisin cakes in my life. And God says, listen, you don't have to chase that anymore. I can break your chains once and for all. I have paid the price that has to be paid for you to be set free and you don't have to wait another day in your life. You can do it right now as a child of God. See, Hosea paid the price to, check this out, to purchase his wife. He bought her and he moved her from slavery to freedom. Don't miss this. Check this out. He bought her in her sin and then he brought her out of her sin. You get it? You can't bring her out of her sin until you buy her. He bought her in her sin. And then he brought her out of her sin. I want you to get this whole thing in your mind. I want you to see this, this picture that's being played out in these tech, this text, okay? Imagine an auctioneer in a room like this. An auctioneer standing on the stage in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And in that moment, the auctioneer opens up the auction. He says, the auction is officially open. And then he brings out Gomer, Hosea's wife. And and she steps up on a pedestal, puts her hands behind her back, and she is naked or nearly naked. And in that moment, the auctioneer opens it up for bid. And he says, is there anyone in this arena who is willing to pay one shekel for this woman? I'm talking about one measly coin, a coin that everybody in the room has in their pocket right now. Is there anybody willing to pay one shekel? Just one shekel. And people are screaming out, she's not worth it. She's trash. She's used up. I won't give a shekel for her. Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine the silence as the auctioneer is waiting for the bid? And then all of a sudden, in the back of the arena, Hosea screams at the top of his lungs, I am not going to give one shekel for Gomer. I'm going to pay full price for her. I'm not going to pay one shekel. I'm going to give you 15 shekels, and I'm going to give you some barley. I'm going to give you bushels. I'll give you so much more because she is worth it to me. Can you see him pursuing his wife? And she's sitting there, standing there with her head down and she's thinking, I'm standing here unfaithful. I'm standing here unworthy. I'm standing here completely guilty. And yet her husband is pursuing her and he's coming to wrap his arms around her. And as he does, he says, I know what you have done. I know who you are. I know the things that you've done in our marriage. And guess what? I still love you. I love you. Do you understand the picture here? Do you know what's taking place here? Jesus did the same thing for you. When you stood there unfaithful, when you stood there unworthy, when you stood there guilty, Jesus said, I know who you are and I know what you've done and I don't care. I love you. You're worth it to me. In fact, you're so worth it that I'm going to give my life for you. Guess what? You were guilty and he redeemed you. And he didn't redeem you with silver coins. You know what the Bible said? He redeemed you with his own blood. 
Read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, check this out, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says you were bought at a price. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ bought us with his blood and he made us free. So just get this. If you have been saved by Christ today, he bought you in your sin and he brought you out of your sin. You get that? Listen, his love for you is unconditional. His love for you is redemptive. Can I, can I give you another one? His love for you is complete. His love for you is complete. He doesn't love you a little bit right now and a little bit more later. No, no, no. He loves you with a complete love. You know what made Hosea's love for Gomer complete? It's the same thing that makes God's love for you complete. It's one thing. You ready? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Read verse three. I said to her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be promiscuous or belong to any man and I will act the same way towards you. You know what he just said? He said, Homer, I want you to be my wife again. I forgive you. I want a fresh start. I want our relationship to be restored. And you know there were days when she thought, why? Why was he willing to pay that price for me? Why does he continue to love me after all I've done, after all my sin, after all my selfishness, after all of my shame, why does he continue to love me? I'm 100% sure she had those thoughts run through her mind. You know why? Because even now, I continue to have those thoughts. I wonder the same thing. Why does God love me? Why does he love us? I don't get it. But the answer is pretty simple. It's because God only knows how to love one way. And that's with a complete love. He doesn't know what it's like to love partially. He doesn't know what it's like to love a little bit. God loves us unconditionally and he loves us completely. He loves us with a love that he says never stops. A love that never lets us go. He said, I love you that much. I love you with a complete love. And because we have experienced the love of God, listen to me, we have every reason in the world to be thankful today. Every reason to be thankful. Let me ask you a question. Are you truly thankful? Are you thankful for the love of God? Are you thankful that he loved you in your sin? Are you thankful that he saved you? Are you thankful that he gave you a chance when you didn't deserve a chance? If your heart isn't overflowing with thanksgiving today, I'm gonna encourage you to do two things. You ready? The first thing I'm gonna challenge you to do today is this. I challenge you to choose thankfulness. To choose thankfulness. You say, I can't do that. I'm disappointed. I've been let down. Everything hasn't gone my way. I can't choose to be thankful. Yes, you can. I believe that thankfulness is a choice. And when we find ourselves living in seasons of ingratitude, I think nine times out of 10, it's because we have chosen to be ungrateful. And God says, choose thankfulness. Sometimes it's just a matter of changing your perspective a little bit. Tell you what, let's play a little game. I want you to think right now about the things in your life that you you dread doing. I mean, the things that you hate doing. What are those things? Like think about chores, Think about, think about the things on your to-do list right now. Like on that list, what are the things that you dread having to do on a week-to-week basis? I'm going to try to read your mind. Dishes. I hate dishes. You say, I hate doing dishes, especially when so-and-so puts them in the sink and doesn't rinse their plate. And like three hours later, i got to chisel stuff, right? Like, how did, it get, how did it harden that quickly, right? How does it, I hate doing dishes. And some of you need to be saying amen to that, right? Some of y'all say, man, you know what I dread doing? I dread doing laundry. It never stops, ever. Constantly washing and drying and folding and sorting and putting away. Some of y'all are thinking about that right now. You're like, man, you just reminded me. I got to do laundry. We're going to Thanksgiving. I got to figure out what I'm going to wear. I hate doing laundry, right? Shake your head if you're... 
Stop looking so spiritual, all right? I mean, shake your head. Some of y'all say, you know what I dread doing? I dread going to work. I mean, it's every day. It's eight to five or whatever your shift is, and you're like, man, I hate it. I, I don't like the people I work with. I, like, I don't really like my job. I just dread going to work. Some of you would have to amen that one. And some of y'all are like, you know what I dread doing? Cleaning the house. Amen. <laughs> About time. First time you've amened this whole time. Man. It's cleaning the house. Listen, you're thinking, man, you know what? Just vacuuming or, or picking up messes that my kids make or my spouse makes. I hate having to pick up after everybody. I hate having to constantly clean up all the time. There are a lot of things like that on our list that we would say, I absolutely hate doing these things. I dread doing these things. But check this out. When you just change the way you look at these things, even the things that you dread doing can become things that you're thankful for. For instance, you go back to the dishes. You say, man, I hate dishes. You can't tell me that there's something good about crusty dishes. But check this out. Maybe next time you're doing dishes, you look at the plate that you're washing. And you just say, you know what? I am so thankful that God provided a meal for me on this plate. And now I have the opportunity to wash this plate. And there's a really good chance that God's going to provide yet another meal that I'm going to be able to enjoy in the days to come on this very same dish. It's a completely different way of looking at it. Or you say, hey, how about laundry? I mean, what are you going to say about laundry? Hey, think about this. Next time, instead of saying, man, I dread doing laundry, maybe next time you say, I am so thankful that I have clean clothes to wear. God gave me a covering, and I don't have to live naked. I'm thankful for that. Listen, we're all thankful for that. <laughs> But he gave me a covering, and he's allowed me to wash that covering, and it's going to smell good, and I can wear it another day, and I can live with a shirt on my back. That's a huge blessing, and I'm thankful for that. Or how about going to work? Man, I dread going to work. I don't like my job. How about this? I'm just thankful that God allowed me to have a job. He allowed me the energy to get up in the morning and go to work. He's allowed me to use my time and my talents to do something that I get compensated for. And now as a result of that, I can provide for my family and we have the means to survive yet another day. God did that. You didn't do that. You say, well, what, about those, what about cleaning the house? I mean, that's a, you can't tell me that there's anything good about that. Yes, there is. God gave you the house. He put a roof over your head. You say, but what about picking up the messes? Listen, God is allowing you to pick up a mess that was made by somebody that lives under your roof that God has blessed you with. He has put that person in your life and now you have the opportunity to demonstrate servanthood like Christ would in picking up that mess after somebody else that you love. You see, sometimes you've got to choose thankfulness. Sometimes it's about just changing your perspective just a little bit to understand that God has blessed you beyond your wildest dreams. But listen, not only does God tell us to choose thankfulness, he tells us to demonstrate thankfulness. He wants us to express our gratitude to him for the blessings he's given us in our life. William Arthur Ward once said, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Think about that. It's one thing to be grateful or to be thankful. It's another thing to express that thankfulness to the God who blessed you in the first place. God says, I want you to express your gratitude. Look at Psalm 147, 7. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. He said, what's on the inside ought to be expressed on the outside. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is you're experiencing, give thanks to God. It needs to be on the outside, what you're feeling on the inside. You go to first, or Colossians 2.6, he said, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. He said, as a disciple of Christ, as you grow to become more like Jesus, you ought to get even better at overflowing your life with thanksgiving. The more you become like Christ, the more you're going to express your thankfulness to Almighty God. He said, overflow with gratitude and thankfulness in your life. You say, how am I supposed to do that? Well, the Bible gives us all kinds of examples. He tells you that if you want to express your gratitude to God, you can do that through singing praise to God. 
You can do that through playing instruments, if you can play an instrument. He said, whatever you're doing, it needs to be on the outside. You need to give it back to God. He says, worship and adoration is a way that we can express that thanksgiving to God. He says, by obeying his commands and just being faithful to what he's called you to do. When you obey the word of God in your life, he said, that right there is an expression of thanksgiving to him. When you trust God's promises in those difficult days and you cling to the promises of God, what you're saying to him is, God, I trust you. And in that trust, what you're doing, you're exhibiting thankfulness to God and gratitude to God, saying, I believe that you are who you say you are and you can do the things you say you can do. But another way we see that we are designed to express our thanksgiving to God time and time again is through giving to the Lord. And we don't like to talk about giving very much. But it's one of those things in the scripture where it's always synonymous with expressing our gratitude and thankfulness to God. If you have your Bible, turn real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to show you a passage of scripture where they're talking about just that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is speaking, and he's speaking to the Corinthian church, and this is what he's telling the church. He's saying, church, I need you to be generous. God wants you to be generous in your giving so that the mission of the church can continue to move forward. And as we read this, understand that he wasn't just talking specifically to the Corinthian church. He's talking to our church. And he's urging us and, and he's pleading with us to be generous in our expression of thanksgiving through giving. He's saying that is what's going to allow the church to move forward and to accomplish my will in the days to come. So in verse 6, Paul is speaking and he said, the point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. What Paul just said was our rewards from God are going to be determined by what we are willing to give to God. Do you understand that? Our rewards from God are going to be determined by what we are willing or unwilling to give to God. And what Paul just said was, if you are only willing to give a little bit to God, then you can expect to receive a little bit from God. But if you are willing to give generously to God, you should, you should receive and expect to receive generous God-sized blessings from the one who blesses us. Verse 7, each person should do what he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. He, he says, you should not give reluctantly. That's not going to work. In fact, that word reluctantly, you can circle that in your Bible. It's the only place in the entire Bible where we see that word. And what it means to give reluctantly, he said, don't give out of compulsion. Don't give because you're being pressured by somebody to give. He said, you shouldn't give if that's the case. But you should give if you're thankful for what God has done in your life. And he said, you should give cheerfully. It ought to make you happy to give back to God. Here's the thing. Hey, what's your name? What's your name? Do you know your name? What's your name? What's your name? Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah. I come up to you right now and I give you $1,000 cash. That'd be awesome, right? It's not going to happen. Don't get excited. I give you $1,000 cash, and 10 minutes later, I say, Isaiah, I want you to give me $100 back. Would you do that? Yeah, of course you would. You'd be excited to do that, right? If I did that to you, if I give you $1,000 cash, 10 minutes later, I said, I need you to give me 100 of that back. Would you be overjoyed to give me $100 back? Of course you would. But for some reason, we have a really hard time giving God what he's asked us for with the rest of our money. Because you know why? We think it's our money. We fail to realize that everything we have, everything we experience, every dollar we make, everything we've acquired or accumulated, it's all his. It's blessings from God. He is the owner. He's just given us the opportunity to steward those funds. Why? Because he wants to give you a platform where you can express your thanksgiving to God. Giving is nothing more than a God-sized opportunity where he can see what's going on on the inside of your heart. What you do in giving, what you don't do in giving, it speaks volumes to God. Nobody knows what you're giving except for you and God. But what you're doing or not doing is speaking volumes about what you truly think about him. Verse 8 says, And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. You know what that means? 
It means that God is not only faithful, but he is able. And he is capable of blessing you in ways that you can't even imagine right now. But he's waiting to see your faithfulness. He's waiting. Verse 10 says, now the one who provides seed for the sower, God, and bread for food, God, will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11 says, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. He just said, I will enrich you temporarily on planet earth just to give you an opportunity to be generous and to extend your gratitude to the one who blessed you in the first place. Giving is just a setup to demonstrate our thankfulness to God. He said, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity. But he goes on to say, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You want to tell God, thank you for the way that you love me. He says, I've given you an opportunity every time we give. Verse 12 says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Listen, we give because we're thankful. That's why we give. Listen, if you are giving out of compulsion, stop giving. But if you are grateful for the blessings of God and the love of God, if you say, I am so overjoyed at the fact that he loves me with an unconditional love, that he loves me with a redemptive love, that he loves me with a complete love. And now I want to take advantage of the opportunity to say thank you to him. If you recognize God's provision in your life and God's blessing in your life, he said, take every advantage you can to say thank you for those blessings through giving. We give because we're thankful for the things that God has already done and even for the things he has yet to do. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Amen.